Good evening and welcome back. Um, well, hopefully it's welcome back for some of you. Maybe some of you it's new. Um, you're just joining us today. Um, I apologize for the lighting, right? I'm still working on that. Um, my name is Miss Jacqueline Pinckney. You may call me either Miss Jackie or Miss Pinckney. And we are continuing today um, learning more about our approach to reading a passage, reading a text, and um, breaking it down. Um, so we've gone over two things already. We've gone over text structure and we've gone over author's purpose yesterday, just to review, um, once again, for maybe for some of you, just to remind you, right? Um, if you didn't take notes, I'm hoping you're taking notes. Um, that's always a good thing, but some of you, you don't need to, so that's fine. So I'm going to go over just briefly what we went over yesterday in terms of the purpose of the passage, right? Um, so we know that the purpose of an author's purpose, um, normally when an author is writing, you know, a, a piece, um, uh, author usually wants to express something, either wants to explain or inform the reader, um, to persuade or to entertain. Right. And as we are reading a text, it's our job to try to find out what are the main ideas that the author is trying to express? What is the author trying to do? Right. What are we what are we walking away from when we walk away from it? What can we say? Like what's going on? So when we are reading a text, um, um, sometimes the, the main idea is clearly stated, especially if you're reading something, an expository, right? An essay of some sort. Um, you know, we're used to having our, our writing our five paragraph essay and we learned that you need to put, you know, your main idea, your thesis in the, in the first paragraph. Normally it could be in the first, um, the, the topic sentence, or maybe it can be the last thing stated in the paragraph, but it also can appear um, in the concluding paragraph. Um, so sometimes you see it right off the bat, sometimes you don't, right? But as you are reading, you are looking at context clues, right? What's happening to let us know, to give us an idea of what the author is trying to get at, what that main idea is. Um, so key terms to look for when you're answering questions related to author's purpose include uh, compare, is the author trying to compare or contrast? criticize, illustrate, describe, identify, is the author suggesting, and so on and so forth. And as you're answering those questions about the author's purpose or the author's main idea, you want to ask yourself, is the author, is it author truly criticizing? Is the author describing or illustrating, right? Um, so always ask yourself and repeat, like, is this what I'm seeing all throughout the passage? As you read, you may also notice some themes. We talked about that yesterday as well. Sometimes those themes are major, sometimes they're minor, right? I used the example yesterday of Harry Potter. There are many themes that we see throughout the books, you know, so uh, major themes could be about, you know, good versus evil and how good triumphs over evil. Minor things could be about the importance of friendship, the importance of, um, you know, how you treat people and um, the importance of, um, you know, perseverance, right? Determination. All those things can come up in a work, right? So when we're reading um, any sort of text, you want to start noticing those things, right? Um, of course, when you have a whole book, it's easier to analyze those things and to identify those things, perhaps, because you have more time, right? Um, but with the SAT, ACT, any sort of standardized test, you're like, there isn't a lot of time, right? So you have to really pull those clues together very quickly. And you really have to pay attention to those details for you to notice, okay, all right, what is the author trying to convey in such a short amount of time, whether that's a piece of fiction or nonfiction, right? Um, and so with a piece of fiction, you have your characters, you have the plot. Um, and through those, you notice things, of, you know, with the dialogue and, and maybe there's some sort of conflict and maybe there isn't, right? Um, and so with a fiction and nonfiction, they express those things in different ways. Okay. Um, also, you, as you read, you'll learn about the author's point of view, the author's tone, which we're going to go more into detail today, um, their attitude their, or their perspective, so to speak, about uh, a topic, a theme, um, through the clues in the text. Um, and then at the end yesterday, I modeled um, reading three passages, three excerpts, 
and modeled how you can read those. You know, maybe some of you liked it, maybe some of you didn't, but the whole point was to show you how to actively read, how to reflect on a text as you are reading, because what happens is that as you're reading and you know, asking yourself questions about what's going on, being the narrator of the text and saying, hmm, what does this mean? Oh, wow, this could mean this. Oh, we read about the tempest, that storm. Oh, it was devastating, right? You end up answering a lot of the questions already. Not everything, I know, not everything. Sometimes they may ask something that's very tricky that you don't really think about as you're reading, but because you are actively engaged in the text, you may naturally um, be able to find the answers a lot quicker. Okay, all right then. So um, once again, um, if you want to interact with me, I believe we do have the chat option. Um, not sure how many of you will actually use that option. That's okay. I think as we go along in this journey, we'll be able to interact more. It's very different, you know, having a class online. Um, um, so for many of us, um, and some prefer it and some don't. Some actually like to be present. But right now, this is what we have. And so, so yeah, please take notes. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to use the chat or even to um, save those for another time and maybe, you know, be able to access the portal and ask those questions about what we go over today. All right, then. So let, now let's dive into style and tone. Okay, so we're going to look at that more in, into more detail today. Okay. So the author's style, we all have a style. Now, when we talk about style, we're not talking about fashion sense, right? Even though that's still style, right? For, uh, for an author, the style in writing can be defined as the way a writer writes, simply put, right? It is the technique that an individual author uses in his writing. It varies from author to author, right? We all have our own favorite authors, right? All, all different genres, right? And, you know, you, I guess, decide who your favorite author is, right, or series is based on the style, right? If you can connect with the style. So this style also, this technique depends on one syntax, word choice, and tone. It can also be described as a voice that readers listen to when they read the work of a writer. Um, and so, and when you think about it too, when you started writing, I remember when I started writing in high school, well, of course I started writing, you know, earlier than that, maybe in third grade, right? But I remember distinctly my English teacher telling me that I needed to have more voice in my writing, like that she couldn't tell. It was just, it was so general that she couldn't tell what I really believed in and what, what my style was. And I had to really change the types of words I used so that I established more tone in my writing. Um, and so it took me some time, it took me some time. So when you think about yourself as a writer, right? And what you need to do as you are conveying a message or writing a story, whatever it is, you, um, whatever, whether it's a piece of fiction or, or nonfiction, right? Think about that process. And then by reflecting on that process, then you're able to hopefully better analyze uh, 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 another author's piece of writing, uh, another author's perspective and style, their voice, looking at those words carefully, because just as you choose your own words carefully to, um, to, to demonstrate, to, to illustrate, to, you know, as I said, convey a message. So too must other authors do that as well. So as we said, style is the way the author uses words, phrases, and a sentence, right? You can play around and it's fun too. When you can play around with the different words, right? It's, it's one thing to say, oh, um, the character was upset versus the character was fuming with fury, right? That's, <laughs> those convey two different things. Those tell you two different things, right? And so as you play around with the words, you start, it paints a different picture. The author's first personal word choice or vocabulary, types of sentences, and point of view from which the text is told, right? That is style. 
and organization of the text. So more about the style. We need to consider the following to analyze an author's style. We need to think about the point of view. And so when we think about the point of view too, um, we think about also, you know, the background information about the author. Now, when we're in our English classes, we have time to, to research the background of the author, the time period, the setting, you know, the historical context, right? That is informing us about um, what the author is writing about and why the author is writing about. Um, in, the, in the test, the only thing that we get is like that small snippet at the very beginning before the passage, which is really important. You know, it's, it's the um, little blurb um, on the top that's normally in italics, right? And it tells us it could be that um, it, it gives, it's a short description, but it's an important description, whether that's fiction or nonfiction, because it gives us a little bit more context and can tell us more about the point of view, right? It tells us about the time period um, or just kind of sets the stage for us. So um, as we, once again, when we're analyzing the author's style, we want to see if it's formal or informal writing type of words, right, can tell us that. The organization structure of the text and the level of complexity in the writing. Um, so once again, I know I always re revert back to Harry Potter, but it's because it's, it's so accessible and it's so easy. I remember at the time, I was reading, you know, I read a book from Harry Potter and then I also read Lord of the Rings. Totally different styles, right? When we talk about the complexity of the writing, the Lord of the Rings, like it, you really had to, um, it, was, it was the way the author presented the writing was so different, right? I had to have a different mindset when I was reading Lord of the Rings versus when I was reading Harry Potter, right? The level of complexity in the writing was very different two different authors, two different styles, still both in the same genre, right? When you have like fantasy, science fiction sort of type um, um, writing. Um, but we could see that um, just the, just as I said, the complexity of the writing, um, the word choice, you know, how the author expressed, you know, uh, you know the, um, the story was very different. By using these features in writing, Different meanings of the content, what the story text is about, are shown to the audience. You can have two authors write about the same thing and you get a whole different take on it, right? Even if it's the same event, right? Um, just because of the author's style. So, Every author has his or her own style. They're, they're using literary devices, tone, and mood. And they use this in a particular way that makes his or her writing recognizable. When you read several books by the same author, you become accustomed to the author's style their style of writing, and sometimes you look for authors for the similar style. So think about it. Who's your favorite author? What's the last book that you read? What type of genres are you interested in? Like for me, example, it's science fiction. You know, think about it. Think about the last book you had to read, and don't talk about the book you had to read in school <laughs> for English class. Think about what did you read, um, you know, for pleasure? What did you read just for fun? right? Um, and why do you, why did you read that book? Not the one in class, not the, forget about that one. <laughs> the, the one that you, you know, you went to the library or that you bought online, you know, that you sought out for yourself. What was it about that author that, what is it about the author that makes you like that piece of writing? Like, like that series, right? Is it just the, the subject matter itself? Or is it how the author is able to kind of capture your attention, how that author is able to tell the story? Um, and it may not even be a story. Maybe it's, you know, um, maybe a, an author for in a newspaper, 
you know, a journalist, right? Um, even for that, even when you're um, writing an informational text, there is still a style of writing. There is a way that, you know, authors can use their words that really kind of um, sort of take you through the piece, right? You're kind of going on a journey. And, um, and those words really do, um, they, they, they tell a story and they paint a picture for you, whether it's a piece of fiction or nonfiction. So defining the author's style, right? So style in literature is a literary element that describes the ways that the author uses words. The author's word choice, sentence structure, figurative language, and sentence arrangement all attributes to that. To establish mood, images, and meaning in the text, right? So let's say, for example, um, who's an author? Well, let's just look at um, actually one of my favorite authors is uh, um, Alexandre Dumas, right? a French author. Um, he wrote The Three Musketeers. Uh, he also wrote uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, right? There's, um, and, then, and some of those were made into several movies, right? And so, but um, this author had just a, a very interesting style for me and, and the mood and how um, he was able to convey, you know, the, um, this adventure, you know, uh, or of um, the, the characters. Um, that's more with the Three Musketeers, but then also with the Count of Monte Cristo, right? Um, how he described, you, you know, how, how um, you know, the, uh, the, the character was betrayed, right? And it's like you were right there with him and how he was, you know, um, taken away and in, in, in the prison, you know, for for years, you know, accused of something that he didn't do, right? And so you, um, the author was able to paint these images even before, you know, there was a movie <laughs> about it. But I remember being kind of carried away, you know, by the words of this author as I'm, I'm kind of witnessing for myself in my mind um, what's happening to this character and how he was backstabbed by his best friend, how he had to, you know, he was locked away and there seemed there was no hope. And, but then he met the old man who was able to um, teach him so many things that he didn't know before, even learning how to fight. And then in the end, uh, hopefully, I don't know if you plan on reading this book, I won't tell you what happened. So maybe you should read it yourself. But that's one of the fun things about reading and, and what authors are able to do is to um, paint this picture in your mind and create the story like where you're creating this a film in your own mind because of how they are able to use the words and manipulate, manipulate the words to manipulate your mind, right? Um, so, and as, as we said, once again, to establish the, the mood, the images and the meaning in the text. So there are four basic literary styles used in writing. These styles distinguish the works of different authors from one another. So, and this is something that we kind of touched on in the very first uh, session, I believe you have expository, or argumentative style. You have a descriptive style, a persuasive style, and narrative style. So yeah, we, we talked briefly about this um, in the very first um, lesson. So more about the expository or argumentative style. Expository writing, th this style is a subject-oriented style. Right, it's normally used to um, inform, to get, explain, give more information. The focus of the writer in this type of um, writing style is to tell the readers about a specific subject or topic. And in the end, the author leaves out his own opinion about that topic, right? So you could be, you know, um, talking about a certain breed of rabbits. I know it's random, right? Um, but, you know, it's a topic that no one really has a feeling about, right? I mean, maybe they do, you know, maybe you have a pet rabbit um, at home, right? But if you're just explaining to someone, you know, the different breeds of rabbits and which ones um, could be um, really conducive to, you know, raising on a farm or having as a pet of some sort, right? You're kind of de giving some details about, you know, maybe how to take care of them. And so you're just given, you know, straightforward information. 
a descriptive style. In descriptive writing style, the author focuses on describing an event, a character, or place in detail. Sometimes it is poetic in nature, where the, where the author specifies uh, an event, an object, or thing, rather than merely giving information about an event that has happened. Um, I think about um, Walden, um, um, you know, uh, talking about, you know, being in the, in the forest, um, or sometimes how, you know, authors are very reflective about, um, you know, in fiction or nonfiction, right? Um, reading some newspaper articles about, you know, say what happened in the election, right, with a, with a debate, or, um, you know, uh, or, you know, a travel magazine. Um, let's talk about that because we haven't been able to travel, have we? Right. And so, and so those are, are, are fun to read, you know, natural geographic, right. Oh, I used to love that as a kid. Um, and they would describe maybe the coral reefs, you know, traveling to Australia or traveling to some other part of the world that I've never been talking about the Arctic, right. Talking about the animals there and, um, and, you know, maybe some of the dangers that are, uh, that, you know, this region is facing, um, and so, so yeah, it has a very vivid and descriptive style because it really, you know, they're, they're trying to get us to imagine that we're there and not just the words, but through also the photojournalism as well. And so that, that photojournalism helps to carry the story and helps to convey also the, the, the message and help with the description as well. Usually the description incorporates sensory details, right? We think about, you know, manipulating the senses, those words, they, they have power. They really do. And it's fascinating. Um, I think, you know, my writing became a lot stronger when I discovered the, the thesaurus, right? Instead of using the same words over and over and over again, right? Like we said, it's different to say, oh, the character was upset versus the, the, the character was fuming with, with a rage that, th that um, permeated deep inside of the soul. Oh, wow, right? And so when you start really um, playing around with the words, using words that, you know, that are synonymous, um, you know, with the, maybe the simple word that you started out with, then it's like you really start being to capture something and to bring people in you know, have that sense, you know, whether that's, um, you know, um, awe or um, suspense um, or even fear, right? I don't like reading those scary stories. I don't know about you, my best friend did, right? But think about that, Stephen King, <laughs> maybe you guys haven't read him, but um, he was quite well known um, when I was growing up and writing these horror stories. And those words, man, mm -mm, I cannot do it. I got too scared, right? Those sensory details, whoo, no. <laughs> so persuasive style. Persuasive style of writing is a category of writing in which the writer tries to give reasons and justifications to make the readers believe his point of view. Um, very typical, say when you're writing um, a speech, right? I taught public speaking um, and yeah, you know, but, this is something that you probably are used to doing as well, even in your essay, whenever you're um, also similar to an argumentative essay, right? When you're trying to prove a point and when you're trying to prove a po point, you're also trying to um, persuade and convince people that you are correct, right? The persuasive style aims to persuade and convince the readers, as I just said. And finally, we have this um, narrative style. Narrative writing style is a type of writing wherein the writer narrates a story. And we're gonna go back to that today, what we um, read yesterday, we're gonna revisit that. It includes short stories, novels, novellas, many novels, right? Biographies and poetry. So any questions so far? I know maybe some of you um, are, have access to the chat, maybe not, right? Um, hope you're with me. You know, I know you probably had a long day. Um, well, some of you, maybe, I don't know if you're um, having uh, classes at home or if you have to go to school, you know, it's a complicated time right now, right? So, um, but hang in there, right? Hang in there. Um, 
So yeah, I know we have a lot of reading um, and um, then you have to juggle that with whatever you have to do at school. Maybe you have some projects coming up, right? Um, but it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. You know, a lot of what we're going over are things that you already know. So you should feel confident about that, that we're just reviewing things that you've already learned before, that you've learned ever since you know, you were in elementary school. And so we're just reviewing that, solidifying that, reinforcing those things, right? So that you feel more confident during the test. Okay, so let's continue. So some style examples. So, um, so, um, so there's gonna be just a piece of writing, uh, you know, a sentence, and then we're, it, it describes, you know, what type of style that is. So. Um, so this is an example of, uh, of an author, you know, writing a sentence. If it sounds like I'm writing, then I prefer to rewrite it. Conversational, really informal in its tone, right? I think it's a good idea, typo, said Jenny. <laughs> you can imagine the outcomes, retorted Emma, pushing the door open. Reluctantly, Jenny followed, right? So we're very familiar with this when we read um, the story. That's a narrative. The sunset fills the entire sky with the lovely deep color of rubies, setting the clouds ablaze. I even read it differently, didn't I? <laughs> right? And so, so yeah, but as you're, you know, reading the description, you know, you get inspired to kind of give a voice to it. I'm very animated if you haven't <laughs> noticed already, right? And so it inspires you, those words inspire you, inspires you. Um, the words inspire you to read in a certain way. Right. So that is a descriptive. But could you see that the sunset filling the entire sky? Oh, can you see the reds and the oranges and the yellows with lovely deep colors of rubies? Oh, that deep red setting the clouds ablaze like a fire. That's beautiful. Oh, I love sunsets. A trip to Switzerland is an excellent experience that you will never forget, offering beautiful nature, fun, and sun. Book your vacation trip today. Don't you want to, aren't you persuaded? Aren't you convinced, <laughs> right? Don't you want to book that ticket now? Click, right? Buy it. Oh, wait, we're in COVID. We probably can't go right now. That's okay. All right. But you, you felt it though, didn't you? You wanted to go, <laughs> right? You were convinced. It was like a commercial, right? It was a commercial, but these days I know, I know we can't go anywhere. Right. But maybe afterwards you, you will. You will. So how to define author's tone. OK. Author's tone is simply an author's attitude toward a particular written subject. It's very different from the author's purpose. And we already reviewed that. Right, Re reviewed that from yesterday. Um, we focused on the author's purpose. The tone of the article, essay, story, poem, novel, screenplay, <laughs> or any other written work can be described in many ways. And hopefully you've, you've read examples of all of these. The author's tone can be witty, you know, it could be funny, right? Um, we could use a lot of that right now. I would not mind reading <laughs> something that's going to make me laugh. It can be dreary, warm, playful, outrage, especially if it's about a topic that it's re that's really contentious, right? That you um, have strong feelings about. Neutral, right? Um, polished, wistful, reserved, and on and on. There's different ways to describe, you know, this writing. Any any author's um, um, writing. Basically, if there's an attitude out there, an author can write with it. And it's fun. <laughs> you don't want something that's boring. You want something that's really going to pique your interest, right? Make you think, make you feel a certain way, even if you disagree, right? That's fine. Last part. Tone indicates the writer's attitude. Often an author's tone is described by adjectives such as cynical, depressed, which has basically been this whole year, right? Sympathetic, cheerful, outraged, which we saw before, 
positive, angry, sarcastic. I like the sarcastic tones. Um, prayerful, mm, you know, reflective, um, ironic, solemn, vindictive, mm, intense, excited, all of those really um, colorful adjectives, right, um, can describe, um, you know, an author's tone. Tone is not an action, it is an attitude, right? So um, be, be careful, right? An author uses different techniques to create the tone he or she wants to convey. But the most important is word choice. It's huge when it comes to setting a tone. And we've talked about this already, right? The, the, the thesaurus is your best friend, right? In terms of using different words, you know, to really um, enhance your style, to really convey that tone, to show, you know, what, you know, what you want your reader to feel, all right? If an author wanted his or her writing to have a scholarly serious tone, he or she would stay away from onomatopoeia, figurative language, and bright flashy words. He or she would probably choose tougher vocabulary and longer, more complex sentences. If however, he or she wanted to be witty and light, then the author would use very specific sensory language, sounds, smells, and taste, perhaps, colorful descriptions, and shorter, even grammatically incorrect sentences and dialogue. And this, you know, um, when I read this, I remember just the tips I gave my students once again when I talk about public speaking, right? And so it's not just the words, it's also how you say the words, right? What you choose to emphasize, what you choose to kind of drag out, right? And I do that even when I read to you, right? I have a very animated way of reading to kind of get you engaged and involved, right? And um, so it's not just so flat, right? Um, and so I take those words and I, you know, give it, you know, give it a voice. You give voice to the words, right? Um, so, so, you know, get used to reading you know, um, to make it more interesting, right? Especially when you're reading the test, right? So get used to adding, you know, a little flavor to it, right? Um, as you are reading and so that it, you become a little bit more engaged, right? And so you, you reflect that tone as you are reading it in your mind. Okay, some examples here how different tones can be created using the same scenario. Okay, let's take a look. So we have two different ones. Okay. The suitcase was packed. His guitar was already on his shoulder. Time to go. He took one last look around his room pushing down the lump forming in his throat. His mother waited in the hallway, eyes red. You'll be great, baby, she whispered, pulling him to her for one last hug. He couldn't answer, but warmth spread through his chest at her words. He walked out into the crisp morning, tossed his suitcase in the back, and left his childhood home, the future shining before him as brightly as the September sun. Mm, wow, is he going off to college? Let's say, you know, it seems kind of sad. It seems like it's, you know, goodbye. You know, that's probably something that you've done before. Maybe, you know, um, you were going off to camp, right? Or maybe it was your first day of school, right? Just saying goodbye. You know, you, you were kind of sad, right? Um, or, you know, maybe uh, some of you are um, athletes, you know, and you have that first important game, you know, then you're saying goodbye as you, you know, go and be with the team and get on the court or the field or what have you, right? And maybe you're, you're nervous, right? And you have all these emotions. And so, so yeah, you can think about different situations that reflect this tone. Okay, so now same situation, but let's see how this, you know, this way this is the second way it kind of conveys this situation, you know, paints the scene. The suitcase was busting at the seams. His old beat up guitar hung around his shoulder. 
knocking him in the head as he tried to get out the, the gold dang door. He looked around his room, probably for the last time, and coughed so he didn't start blubbering like a baby. His mom stood there in the hallway, looking like she'd been crying for the last 15 hours. You'll be great, baby, she cooed and pulled him into a hug so tight he felt his inside squishing around. He didn't answer, and not because he was upset or anything, more because she'd squeezed the words out of his throat. He clomped out of the house, threw his junk in the car, and smiled as he revved the engine. See, look at that. So they just, they're describing, both of these are describing the same um, situation, um, the, the same encounter, the same goodbye, right? But both authors used entirely different words to describe what was going on, right? So the second tone, how would you, how would you, how would you describe it? The first versus the second. So say it to yourself. You know, I know I can't hear you. Maybe one day I will. But tell, talk to yourself. Tell, tell, imagine as if I can hear you, right? And that the other students can hear you. What would you say was different between the first one and the second one? Take a second. What was so different? How did you feel as I was reading those words to you? The first one versus the second one. You know, was there, um, you know, did you feel a little bit sadder with the first one? Was the second one a little bit funnier, right? Did it paint a different picture? Did it seem more serious with the first one? Did it seem less serious with the second one? What is it that the author wanted us to focus on, right? Were there still similar feelings, but did maybe we perhaps feel differently about those feelings, right? You know, maybe... The second one, it didn't seem as big of a deal, right? Meaning like his departure not being as big of a deal, right? It was kind of, it was kind of funny, right? It was kind of funny. As you, could you imagine his beat up old suitcase and guitar, right? Busting at the seams. Sounds like my suitcase when I go traveling, right? And <laughs> trying to get out of the door, uh, right? And so him trying to kind of hold stuff back, right? And so, yeah, he was sad, but then you felt kind of like, oh, wow, you know what? It's, it's, it's time to go. It's time to, it's time to get out, right? Oh, mom, she's hugging me too much. Mom, oh, no. I'm okay, mom. All right, all right, all right, right? I know you're going to miss me, but it's time to go, okay? So, so you can see that it's, it's, I find it fascinating, right, when you think about the power of words once again and how they can paint entirely different pictures and conjure up different feelings inside of you, right? And so once again, as you're reading, have fun with it. Why not? <laughs> you know, you might as well have fun, you know, as you're sitting there for how many hours is you, are you going to be there with the test? So you might as well make it interesting. Okay, so let's look at this one. He could hear his mom wailing inside and chuckled to himself as he backed out of the drive toward the unknown. What waited around the bend, he wasn't sure, but he was absolutely 100% positive it was going to be good, really good. Even So even though both these paragraphs talk about a young man leaving his mother's house, the tone of the passages are very different, as we were saying, right? The, um, that last part was kind of um, um, in addition to what, we, what was um, stated here before, right? And so... But um, the first is wistful, more nostalgic, whereas the second is a little bit lighthearted when we think about the beat up old guitar and the, the, um, the suitcase that's busting at the seams, right? That he should have probably repacked and you know probably taken some stuff out, okay? That was a fun exercise. Okay, so author's tone on reading tests. Did you have any questions about that? Did that make sense what I said? You know, it, it, it was pretty clear, though, as we read the, the two different um, perspectives, right? Um, the two different styles, you know, the tone was very different. Okay, so reading comprehension tests like ACT reading or evidence-based reading on the SAT will often ask you to determine the author's tone of different passages, although they may not come right out and ask you in that way. Some will, but many do not. Here are some questions you could see on the reading comprehension portion of an exam that relate to author's tone. So 
So these are just example questions, right? It's not going to be, as it says, just straightforward saying like, oh, what's the author's tone? Eh, maybe sometimes, eh, right? But it's a test. We, we know better than that. So which of the following choices provides the most vivid description while maintaining the author's tone of the article? That's one example. Let's look at another one. What does the author want to convey through the use of the word bitter and morbid, right? So using some vocabulary words in, in context, right? Um, and then um, seeing once again, okay, what, it, what, is, what is that message by using certain words? The author's attitude toward mom and pop cafes could best be described as, so as you're reading, you know, whatever that text was, which is obviously about, as we see here, mom and pop. Here, I can use my thing now. So you all see. Ta-da! So we know that that text that it's referring to, which we, we're, we haven't read, but once again, this is just an example question, right? That it's that this author is talking about mom and pop, pop cafes, and this author obviously has some sort of a perspective on that, right? And so as you are reading about the, you know, this author's perspective, you want to decide, okay, you know, is it a positive? Is it something positive or negative? That's one easy way to start, right? Um, especially if you're coming across words that you may not be familiar with in the answer choices. So as you're reading, ask yourself, was it positive or negative? Right. And then you want to, once you decide if it was positive or negative, right. And maybe it's kind of be in between, right. The neutral, then you want to go toward those words that best kind of reflect that as best as possible. Right. Um, so that's one trick I use whenever I'm trying to figure out tone. I'm like, okay, positive, negative. Like, how did I feel inside? Did I feel, hmm? Or did I feel, hmm? Did I feel, hmm? <laughs> right. I was like, hmm. Didn't really feel much of anything, right? And so, um, but n normally there's not going to be indifference, <laughs> right? If anything, if you're feeling like, oh, I didn't feel much, then it's really just like an informational text. Then really it's just kind of straightforward and very didactic, very just instructional. Based on the information in lines 46 through 49, the author's feelings about environmentalists in the Sahara could best be described as, so you're looking at those key words there. And so um, here it seems to be um, focusing on, so you're going to scan the text. Oops, sorry. There we go. And find out where in the passage the author talks about environmentalists in the Sahara, right? which is they say here, because the tone can change throughout the passage, right? It's very possible. It's very possible, right? Um, in terms of the perspective or how the author feels about certain things, right? So you have to be, you have to be careful and you have to pay attention to what the question is asking. Look at the specifics, look at the details, right? Because in that particular section, it can be very different than an, a, total, uh, a totally other section. Which emotion is the author most likely trying to rouse, you know, from the, the reader? Conjure, right? Try to, to create. Um, so the author of the article would most likely describe the American Revolution as, right? So also key here, let me use my um, most likely. So be careful because once again, um, I may have said this before, and if I haven't, you know, um, most likely doesn't mean perfectly, <laughs> right? So you're not always going to find the perfect answer. And perfect is relative, right? It's a relative term because perfect basically means like what you think it should be, <laughs> right? Um, and it's not always what you think it should be. Um, so the whole point is trying to figure out, okay, what is the answer that they're looking for because you want to get it right. So it's basically like, what, what is it that um, makes the most sense based on the answer choices, right? So once again, you're not always going to find a perfect answer. So just get it out of your mind that you're going to find a perfect answer, right? Find something that's the closest, the best answer. And the best answer you may not always like, Okay. You may not always like the best answer, but based on the choices that you have, that's what you're left with. 
what emotion does the author want to convey through the use of the statement, never again? So you just go back in the text, see what the author was talking about, you know, during that time and say, okay, why did the author say that? What was going on? You know, what was the author trying to emphasize, agree or disagree with, what have you, right? Okay, so let's practice. Any questions? Let me go to my chat. Nope. I feel I'm lonely all by myself talking to myself, but that's okay. <laughs> right? Okay. So we have about 15 minutes left. Okay. So, and we are going back to <laughs> the Frederick Douglass narrative. Okay. And you're like, oh, I want something different, right? Sometimes it's good to take the same text and look at it over and over again and look at it from different perspectives. You're looking at, you're breaking it down, analyzing and looking at, um, you know, um, different parts of the text. Look, you know, we're looking for different things. Okay, so once again, to review, um, this is uh, by Frederick Douglass um, from Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. Once again, Frederick Douglass, born, um, um, lived between 1818 and 1895 was born into slavery in Maryland. As an adult, he escaped into freedom. He became a writer, orator, which is a speaker, an advocate for the abolition of slavery. In 1845, 16 years before the start of the Civil War, Douglas, pub Douglas published his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. In this passage from chapter eight, Douglas is a 10 year old slave, okay? Some of you are like, we did this already, I know. Okay, let's look. Okay, so. In a very short time, okay, I, I always narrate, guys, right? So I so apologize if you don't like it, but modeling, once again, how you can read the text, right? And reflect on the text. In a very short time after I went to live at Baltimore, my old master's youngest son, Richard, died. And in about three years and six months after his death, my old master, Captain Anthony, died, leaving only his son, Andrew, and daughter, Lucretia, to share his estate. So that must be, now I'm, I'm trying to imagine even just, you know, how that must have been, you know, for, was it um, Andrew and Lucretia. So first their younger brother dies and then their father dies. Eee, Lord, that was, must've been a really tough time. He died while on a visit to see his daughter at Hillsboro. Cut off thus unexpe unexpectedly, he left no will as to the disposal of his property. Ooh. So I only know that when there was a death in my family, when there's no will, it gets tricky and it can get ugly, right? Because people are like, greedy they're trying to get what they can right so they're like oh this should be mine this should be mine it was therefore necessary to have a valuation of the property that it might be equally divided between mrs lucretia and master andrew i was immediately sent for to be valued with the other property here again my feelings rose up in detestation of slavery i had now a new conception of my degraded condition Prior to this, I had become, if not insensible to my lot, at least partly so. At least partly so. So, once again, if we had said ye yesterday, so so the beginning really is just okay. This is the, what's happening. Just giving us just some details of the situation, the context, right? This person died, then this person died. This is what needed to happen. There was no will. They had to divide up the estate. But now we see the author's feelings. Here again, my feelings rose up in detestation of slavery. I had now a new conception of my degraded condition. Degraded doesn't sound good. The condition is bad, right? All of a sudden, once again, Maybe he was able to forget it before, you know, day-to-day -day life, you do your job, you do what needs to be done. Your everyday existence isn't really, sometimes it's just boring, right? You're like, it's monotonous. You know, you're just doing the routine. You don't really think about, you don't reflect actively of like, okay, am I in a good position or not? Sometimes you're like, I just need to get, get along with my business, right? 
But when this event happened, this really pushed him to feel like, wow, this is terrible. This is not, this is not good. I hate this, right? I left Baltimore, oops, sorry, with a young heart overborne with sadness. See, look, we're getting these words here. And a soul full of, a soul full of apprehension. Apprehension, you're not certain, you're hesitant. Mm, you don't know what's going to happen, right? Man, oh no, I'm going to be sold again. I took passage with Captain Rowe and the schooner Wildcat. And after a sail of about 24 hours, I found myself near the place of my birth. I had now been absent from it almost, if not quite, five years. I, however, remembered the place very well. I was only about five years old when I left it to go and live with my old master on Colonel, on Colonel Lloyd's plantation. So that I was now between 10 and 11 years old, right? So imagine that that age of five, I can't even remember what I was doing when I was five years old, uh, kind of sort of, yeah, you know, kindergarten, right? It normally is fun and games. For him, no, for him, no. So we continue. We were all ranked together at the valuation, men and women, old and young, married and single, were ranked with horses, sheep, and swine, farm animals. There were horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children. So all mixed up together, imagine, right? So if you grew up on a farm, you're like, oh, I'm used to being around farm animals, right? But normally, if you're around farm animals, it's because you're taking care of them. That's your job. That's part of, part of maybe um, how your family um, you know, um, your the way of life, family living, right? Where you get your food. Right? <laughs> and so it's part of, um, maybe your chores. My best friend grew up on a farm, right? Um, you know, you had your chickens and, you know, you had, they were growing tobacco at the time. They got the horses, they got the cows, they had all that. Right. And you had your duties, right? So, but this is different how he's describing it. Oh, so side by side horses and men, right? Side by side, cattle and women, right? Side by side, pigs and children all together, all mixed in as if they were the same, as if they were one. And as he says here, all holding the same rank in the scale of being. When I think about rank, I think about military, right? If you're um, a sergeant, a major, captain, right? It's clear, you know, who's above the other, right? But in this case, they're all the same. We all, we all in the same boat, you know? Oh, here, there's the pig, there's the horse, there's the cattle, you know? I'm seen just like, you know, those animals. And we're all subjected to the same narrow examination. Narrow examination, I find that interesting, right? This narrow examination, when I think about narrow, I think of something that's not open-minded. I think of something that's very specific, very detailed, that doesn't allow for much room, you know, um, no, no variety, no... Um, um, th th there's no room for exceptions, you know, it's just like, we're all looked at in the same way. Silvery headed age and sprightly youth, maids and matrons had to undergo the same indelicate inspection. So we see the use of words, indelicate, not careful, right? Very, mm, how should I say, um, mm, impersonal dehumanizing, right? At this moment, I saw more clearly than ever the brutalizing effects of slavery upon both slave and slave holder. Brutalizing, right? So when we started in the beginning, it was very just matter of fact, very descriptive. This is what was happening. But then we start getting into the author's feelings about his lot, about his situation, about what's going on and how much sadness that brought him, how that realization of, oh, wow, am I even really a human? Obviously not, because I'm being, you know, looked over like I'm a, um, you know, a, you know, a piece of property and a farm animal. Okay, so let's go to the reading comprehension question. So once again, we didn't, we already did this. So why did Douglas go to Baltimore? Right, he was sold. He had to be sent to live with them. 
um, how did Douglas and the other slave um, view Master Andrew? They probably didn't, you know, based on that, we're not sure, right? Um, we can we we can guess, right, that maybe, you know, that they weren't really happy with what was about to happen, but we don't, there's nothing that indicates how the Master Andrew treated them, right? But they did know that they're about to be, you know, sold, right? They're about to be divided, you know, that they're now going to be the property of someone else. In the passage, Douglas explains that slavery was humiliating. Cite text from the passage that clearly supports this idea. And we did this last time. If you weren't with us last time, we just did it, um, you know, right now. You know, all those things point to how he, uh, he felt that it was humiliating. Okay. Detestation, degraded condition, all of those things tell us and show us what the author was feeling about what was going on, about his condition. Okay, sorry, that was a little ride, <laughs> a little roller coaster ride, okay? And we found examples in the text, right, already. So as you were reading, so it was very easy, right? Now, of course, I took time to do that, but that's because I was wanting to model for you what, you ne what needs to be going through your head as you're reading these things. Right. And as you read these things actively, you're automatically able to answer those questions. Right. Sometimes quickly, but then sometimes maybe not as quickly, but you, you remember what was going on. Right. And that's why I like to read things like that. So in the beginning, if you're not used to reading that, does that take time? Yes, it does. It does take time. But as you do it more and more, it, it, you get quicker at it and you automatically start analyzing and, and, and um, viewing the text in this way. In such with the, this critical lens. Okay. Any questions about what we did today? Right. And so um, as we had the reading practice, and go back to it. Right. Um, and also the tone, I'm going to go back. I know this is going to be a ride guys. So hold on. Actually. So we go back to the tone, right? Remember that words are powerful and they carry, um, you know, um, here we go. The words are powerful. So, and I, I love the, um, how, you know, it was this, how the, um, this exercise of this same incident, right? Um, and it, the picture that, that was painted was so different. Right. And so you want to look at the words that were being used. Right. Um, so like how the when we look at the two um, passages here, when we go back and review, you know, th this part was like th that was different. Right. How they described him, you know, getting ready to go. Right. Here was very different than with the second one. <laughs> and we see here very different. Busting at the seams, right? <laughs> that gives us a different imagery, right? And so as you are reading your text, you know, take notice of those adjectives and what those adjectives do, how they move you, what types of feelings come up inside of you. Because when you are aware of that and very self-reflective, then you're able to answer those questions a little bit easier, right? Um, you may have some answer choices that may be, you know, very difficult. But like I said, start first and, and ask yourself, do I have positive or negative feelings? Start from there and then um, evaluate your answer choices. Okie dokie. Well, that's it for today, right? We will continue on next week. Thank you for joining us. Um, and for committing to getting better. Um, thank you for making this commitment. So even though some of you may be in this kicking and screaming, you read, so you may not want to be here. You're like your parents forced you to, but you know what? You are making a good decision in trying to, you know, improve your skills, you know, do that review so that you're better prepared for this next step in your future. Okay. All right, then it's not always going to be fun, but we can make it fun sometimes. Okay. All right. Okay, you all have a good evening. Take care.